Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, a podcast brought to you by SciStarter, recorded live before a canned audience at Bob's Sound Library and Tropical Fish Emporium. In this episode, through the magic of radio and patio, we'll meet fascinating scientists working in far-flung locales, from scenic Switzerland to the furthest reaches of deep space. Fasten your seatbelts, and remember, all small electronic devices must be set to podcast mode until we arrive safely at our final destination. Hey, Bob. Hey, Caroline. Welcome to the Sound Library. I'm so looking forward to starting this new season with you, and especially doing some virtual travel. Man, I've been going stir-crazy during the pandemic. Right. We all need a little travel, even if it's virtual. Well, fortunately, we've got a pretty extensive collection of sound effects, animals, ambiences here in Bob's Sound Library. I think everything we're going to need for an escape. But first, I do want to thank Justin Shell, who led us on so many great adventures during season one of the Citizen Science podcast and extend a warm welcome to you, Bob, for season two. Thanks, Caroline. Happy to be here. Great. And to kick off this season, we're going to try something a little different. Since we've been cooped up during the pandemic, we thought we'd go on a virtual trip to visit some of our favorite citizen science projects, starting with Crowdwater. Right, Crowdwater. They're using citizen scientists to sort of patrol rivers all over the world and report on pollution and water levels and other hydrological stuff. And they're located in Zurich, Switzerland, which seems like a great place to visit. Sure, why not? And thanks to the magic of sound effects, our travel time to Zurich is about mm, seven seconds. Flight 52, Don, stop to Zurich, ready for takeoff and landing. Please fasten your seat belts and stow away all carry-on bags beneath the seat in front of you. Thanks for flying Bob's Sound Library and Tropical Fish Emporium. Man, so nice to get outdoors. Oh, wow, there's the bells of St. Peter's Cathedral. Magical. Zurich's famous for all its church bells. Oh, here we are, Crowdwater Central, with Sarah, Franziska, and Miriam. Could you guys introduce yourselves so I don't have to mispronounce your last names? Okay, my name is Sara Blanco, and yeah, I am working in the Crowdwater Project since September as a PhD student. And my uh, role in crowd water um, will be more t- to work about water quality for the crowd water project. Okay, Francisca? And my name is Francisca Schwarzenbach. Ah, okay. So okay. maybe more difficult. <laughs> and I work in the crowd water project as a community manager. So I do a bit of background work and outreach for the crowd water project. And Miriam? So I'm Miriam Scheller and I started together with Sarah in the Crowdwater project in September and I'm also a PhD student. Great. Welcome to all of you. So Sarah, maybe you could start us out and tell us a bit about Crowdwater. Uh, Well, Crowdwater is a citizen science project in hydrology, which means that we are working and interested in the study of water, you know, regarding, for example, water levels, which is really useful and important for decision-making about droughts or floods, for example. Right, so important. And Francisca, how did Crowdwater get started? Yes, so in the very beginning, it all started without an app or without um, anything global. So it started in in Switzerland and the first PhD students started to um, ask people on the streets about the discharge in rivers and about water levels. And then they started to develop a tool um, on how people can collect observations of, of water levels. And so it got um, more and more like complicated and more and more possibilities to, to um, contribute to the crowd the project. And of course, more and more international. And now it is globally accessible. Oh, great. So that means listeners can join in wherever they are. Sarah, could you walk us through how they can get involved? Well, everyone can join the Crowdwater project. And first, you need a smartphone, so you can uh, download the Crowdwater app in your Apple or in your Play Store. With the app, we can 
make observations about water levels, soil moisture, and plastic pollution, for example. So once you have the, the app in your phone, you can, for example, if you go for a walk in your neighborhood or in your city, you can use the app um, in any river that you find. So you can make observations about these um, about these categories and you can create spots and then you can see like other spots if they are already. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, what does it mean create a spot? Okay, create a spot is for example, if you go uh, for a river and then you see, for example, plastic pollution in that river. So uh, using your GPS of your phone, you create a point uh, where you can describe how many plastic pollution you can observe in that point. So after this, other people visit this point and they are using the app, they can see what you uh, made in the past and they can update this point uh, just like uh, refreshing the information about this. Wow, so anyone can add new data to anyone else's spot. I wonder if maybe people are kind of reluctant. One of the most asked questions we get at SciStarter about projects is, if I do something wrong, will I wreck the research? So, Miriam, are Crowdwater volunteers also worried about this, and are people ever afraid to enter data? Yeah, thank thank you so much uh, for that question, because that's like really what I also experienced when I first explained the app or the project to people how they can do the observations and all of them were like a bit scared like yeah so i experienced exactly the same and then i always tell like you cannot do anything wrong like nothing will happen because we will check the spots also and we will give you feedback and you will get a comment and there's really nothing you can do wrong there so just start and go for it and we will give you some nice feedback okay i'm gonna try it And it's a perfect time for it because, I mean, I don't know what the weather has been like there, but here we've had a lot of snow and sleet and rain. Um, Have you been seeing that in Europe and is it reflected in your crowd water data? So over the last weekend in Europe, there was a lot of high flow because there was a big snow melt event and also a lot of precipitation in large parts of Europe. So lots of the rivers were really, really full with water and there was one user like updating his spot um, every second hour. So we had a really nice time series there. And so this such a support is just amazing. And we are so happy to see uh, such things and also very interesting then to see the stats of this spot. That's great. Any other stories or anecdotes you'd like to share? My sister just told me last week when there was so much like rain and uh, like or snow melt here in our region so she she went to the river with her small children and they were like first not getting what have changed and then she actually showed them the picture from the last time they were there the picture they made in the app and then they were like really astonished and like wow it changed so much the color of the stream and the the level where the water level is so i'm really happy they learned something on their hike oh that's great But, you know, right now, um, a lot of people are sticking close to home. Are there ways for people to get involved, even if they can't go outside? Yeah, so that's uh, where the Crowdwater game comes in. And that's a very cool uh, opportunity to contribute to Crowdwater without leaving your house. So you can play the Crowdwater game. And there uh, there are 12 rounds every day. So you can participate every day. It's about five minutes that you need. So you compare the water level um, on two pictures of the same site, so that have been uploaded to the same spot. And then you um, determine the water level class. And because many people know more than just one single person, so we use the principle of the wisdom of the crowd, uh, we get a very good result there of the water level. So the mean of all these people playing the crowd with the game gives us a very good idea of the water level on these pictures. And of course, you can also win very cool prizes. And uh, depending on where you live on the planet, maybe when it's winter for you, you get a bottle um, where your tea stays hot the whole day with the Crowdwater logo, of course. Or if it's summer, you may get a swim back so you can take it to the beach. So you will get something back from Crowdwater for your participation. Well, you get a real prize. It's not like a virtual digital <laughs> prize on a screen that you, you download. It's a real prize? It's a real prize and we <laughs> send it all over the world. <laughs> so cool. I want one. 
So, Sarah, April is Citizen Science Month. Can you share your plans for that with us? Well, uh, we are planning to have two webinars during April, and our plan is to have a first webinar to present and introduce people uh, the Crowdwater Project and the app, so people can join this webinar and learn more about Crowdwater, but also um, learn how to use the app. And then we will have another webinar. Uh, it's more like a follow-up and feedback webinar uh, where people can join to share uh, their experiences using the app, but also like ask questions about the use of, of the project, but also the app. I love it, and I am up for the challenge. Anything else you want to share? Yeah, maybe why it is so important to to have this data from the Crowdwater project and why why this data is so valuable. And that's just because there's there's such a, a lack of data about water and water is so important for all of us. So it's definitely worth it to collect data about water with such a simple method like like uh, with the Crowdwater app. So it, it helps a lot also in regions where there's no water data at all. And people are just everywhere on, on the globe, everywhere people could get some measurements and it can be such a high resolution where a sensor could never have such a high resolution. So that's absolutely worth it to collect this data to get more information about water. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for being with us and taking this time. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really nice to chat with you. I mean, that was great. I happen to live right near the confluence of two creeks in Maryland, and I'm thinking this would be like the perfect place to set up a crowd water spot. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so who and where are we meeting next? Patrick Troyhart from Spirograph. That's where citizen scientists help astronomers study spiral galaxies. Galaxies. Okay, that's perfect because I just happen to have Carl Sagan's Spaceship of the Imagination here, where we can visit billions and billions of galaxies. Yeah, that's 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 about as far as I go. So what do you think? Nice ride, but no cup holders? Hey, it was the 70s. And now we're a gajillion light years from Earth. Let's meet our intergalactic guide. Can you introduce yourself, Patrick? Sure, yeah, so I am Patrick Troithart. Uh, I am an astronomer at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome to our humble spacecraft, Patrick. Could you tell us a bit about Spiralgraph and what volunteers do? Sure, I mean, it's, a, it's actually a really simple project. So what people are actually doing is they're looking at pictures of galaxies um, and they should all be spiral galaxies, which are just galaxies that look like pinwheels. Uh, and then when, when people confirm that, then all we do is we have them trace out the spiral structure they see. We just have them trace over the arms. And we have multiple people doing the same galaxies and we see where people agree. And that helps us determine where the spiral arms are. And why have people do this? Um, aren't computers really good at processing images? These images aren't aren't the greatest. Like the contrast between the arms and the interarm regions is pretty low. And so computers have a hard time distinguishing where the arms, you know, begin and end. But people are really good at seeing patterns and people can actually pick out these spiral arms pretty easily. So that's why we want people to trace out the arms. So that way we don't have to use the images. We can use people's tracings and we can measure, measure the spiral arms that way. And why do you want to measure them? So th it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting idea. So not many galaxies have their spiral structure measured to begin with. And the interesting thing is, is that there are relationships between how tightly wrapped the spiral arms are and properties of these spiral galaxies that are much more difficult to measure than, than just measuring the spiral arm structure. So the tightness of the arms relates to things like the mass of the supermassive black hole found in a galaxy's nucleus. Um, it also relates to the mass of the stars that make up that bright ball that's in the center of the galaxy, what, that we call the bulge. Um, it also relates to how fast the galaxy rotates, and that also relates to the amount of dark matter contained within a galaxy. So, so basically, by, by measuring how tightly wrapped these arms are, we get good approximations for a number of parameters for, this, for, for a galaxy 
you know, relatively quickly and cheaply. That's incredible. And where are you now in the project? Um, so we have, right now we have a total sample of about 20,000 galaxies we're looking at. Um, and we broke that into uh, a sample of about 6,000 and a sample of about 14,000. Um, the first sample of 6,000, um, we were, we think we're done collecting the data on those. And the other set of 14,000 galaxies, we're, we're actually uh, finishing that up pretty, pretty soon. So we, we estimate that we should be done in about a month. Okay, so are you about done? Is that it for the citizen science portion? No, no. At this point, no. We still need people. We still need people to work on it. If people people get busy, you know, and and can't can't spend so much time classifying. I mean, we could always use more people to help. You know, the faster we're done, the, the faster we can, uh, you know, start start analyzing the data. So, people are always welcome to help, and and it's greatly appreciated. And are the uh, volunteers doing good work for you? Are you getting usable data? Oh man, yeah. So. Man, the volunteers have been fantastic. Uh, let me tell you, the, I mean, there's some users who have classified, you know, 10,000 galaxies over the lifetime of this project, which is Whoa. literally less than a year now. And so I think there's one user that's probably at about 10,000 galaxies at this point. But there, there are plenty that have done, you know, a thousand or more. They found a, uh, a satellite, a tumbling satellite. Uh, they found supernovae. Uh, one has been previously unclassified. So this person managed to... Uh, get that actually registered in uh, the International Astronomical Union database. Um, yeah, I mean, they're just unusual looking galaxies. People have pointed out weird, weird things that, you know, we just tag and, and hopefully are able to look at later. Um, just, just recently, somebody, somebody found a galaxy that looked kind of like a race car. I think it's a type of galaxy called an, an elliptical shell galaxy, um, but it's not like one I've ever seen before. So I don't, I don't know for sure that that's what it is. So there's just a lot of things people are finding and just pointing out. It's, it's fantastic. People are really engaged in this project. It's great. That is amazing. But with people processing that many images and doing it so fast, are there any issues with accuracy? You know, it's almost like the question, you know, are people inherently good or inherently evil? You know, and, and man, you find out that people are inherently good when you see what they're doing on this project. I mean, they're incredibly conservative and cautious as to what they input. They're like, well... I'm not totally sure that this is a spiral arm, so I'm not going to do this. Is that okay? And I'm like, you can take some liberties. You know, if you if you think the spiral arm goes out a little bit further, you can trace that. You know, there's some room for interpretation. I mean, that's why that's why we're using people. We need your brain to interpret the spiral structure. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's amazing how how good people are at this and how they don't want to sow chaos into the project. How they're very careful and and want to provide good data. It's it's really great. Anything else you'd like to share? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I mean, I just want to say that I'm really grateful to everybody's participation. I mean, we, we really did not think that we would, you know, finish 20,000 galaxies in basically a year. We thought it would take, you know, two, maybe three years to do. So it's, it's amazing that people have been so helpful with this project. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, thanks a lot. This is, this is great. And now, once again, for the very first time, it's time for a little something that we like to call the news with Caroline Nickerson. You bet. We have a few updates for you, loyal listener. Most importantly, Citizen Science Month. It's coming in April, and there's really something for everyone. Whether you're planning an event for your community group, finding a featured project to do on your own time, or just doing something cool, creative, new, and related to citizen science, you can celebrate it in April. Go to citizensciencemonth.org to learn more. And spoiler alert, there are Citizen Science Month events for every project featured on this podcast. Yeah, and I also heard from a reliable source, that would be you, that this year libraries will play an important role. You heard correctly. And our supporters, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, are currently accepting applications for $5,000 mini-grants to support 13 different United States libraries during Citizen Science Month. Do you represent a library? Apply! Learn more at scistarter.org forward slash NLM. And we'll be talking with some of those library folks in an upcoming podcast. You know, but it's not like April's the only time we've got citizen science events, right? 
That's right. Really, it's more of a citizen science year. We have an event coming up in March with the Narika Project, which is all about contributing to mental health and dementia research by playing games on your phone. You can find the details in the featured project on scistarter.org forward slash NLM. That's the letter N, the letter L, and the letter M. It stands for National Library of Medicine, so scistarter.org forward slash NLM. Thank you so much to the network of the National Library of Medicine for supporting us during that event and the head of the Narika Project, Claire Gillian, for joining us virtually from Ireland during that event to answer questions. We'll see you on March 18th, 11 a.m. Eastern, scistarter.org forward slash NLM. Wow, that's so cool. Ireland, we are so, so cosmopolitan. So by the way, where do you live when you're not here in the um, Bob's Audio Library? Well, Bob, I live on Zoom. In fact, our listeners can join me on Zoom any given Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern for Make It Count Monday, the weekly live stream show from SciStarter and NC State University. Host Deja Perkins and I have fun and learn a lot about a featured project each week with a different guest speaker. Learn more at SciStarter.org forward slash NCSU. Yeah, make it count Monday. Yet another way you can join the Citizen Science Party. You can also check out the thousands of projects looking for your help at SciStarter.org. And they include the project we're visiting next, run by Scott Eustace. Scott is awesome. Scott is the Community Science Director at Healthy Gulf. I know he'll introduce himself. Um, we're going to hear from him in just a moment. But Healthy Gulf is an inspiring nonprofit that operates all around the Gulf Coast. But no matter where you are in the world, you can participate in Land Loss Lookout and help document land through several different protocols that might need restoration. I'll let Scott tell you about it. OK, so that means our next stop is the Mississippi Delta. Hey, the Spaceship of the Imagination control panel is, like, completely blank. Well, um, you do have to use your imagination. Oh, right. Okay, I can do this. Okay, warm breezes, singing birds, frogs. Oh, yeah. And here we are. Nice to be back on Earth. You said it. That's right, homebound listeners, close your eyes and enjoy the warmth and humidity of the Louisiana River Delta. And there's Scott. Hey, Scott, welcome to the Citizen Science Podcast. Can you introduce yourself for our listeners? My name is Scott Eustace. I'm the Community Science Director at Healthy Gulf. Hey, Scott, could you tell us about Healthy Gulf? Uh, Healthy Gulf is an environmental nonprofit, and we've been working for clean water healthy wetlands and sustainable fisheries in the northern Gulf of Mexico for the past 26 years. And Land Loss Lookout, that's the citizen science portion of Healthy Gulf, right? How does that work? On Land Loss Lookout, we have a server that will show you different images of wetlands in Louisiana, and you'll be directed to one of six projects. Each of these six represents a process that has affected our wetlands. One of them is shipping channels. Um, we do have a lot of federal shipping channels in Louisiana, and they have carved up a certain amount of wetlands. Shipping channels have a particular shape and size and orientation in relation to the wetlands. So uh, we'll take you through a tutorial that trains you to look for those patterns, to look for those shapes, sizes, and orientations. And if you see that pattern in one of the photographs, photographs that you are served, we want you to tell us, yes. And why is this project important? We're seeing that the, the wetlands are disappearing almost from the inside out. We're very interior spaces, far from any shipping channel, far from any oil and gas field, far from any place that even people in coastal Louisiana would go in a boat. The wetlands are, are being lost, and they're being lost in a way that it's, it's like thousands of tiny little ponds are forming way out in the middle of the marsh. That's what we recognize as the impact of sea level rise. And it's something you can't see by boat. 
because it's happening far away from where you can access by boat in these shallow waters. Um, so often when we're showing these photographs to people from Louisiana, it's a, it's a bit of a revelation, even if they've been on the water all of their life, because they've never had that um, aerial perspective combined with the, the training to recognize the pattern. And anyone in the world can do this project. You don't have to be on the Gulf Coast. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we, to date, we have a few hundred participants. We'd like uh, a few thousand, <laughs> frankly. To go through a tutorial, you can, um, you know, when you, if you do it once, you'll go through one tutorial to look at one impact pattern. Uh, you can do it six times for the six different patterns. We invite people to keep doing it into the, until they've done all six. So you'll be getting all this great data uh, to help protect the Gulf, but also you're, you're informing people and educating them about the importance of the Gulf at the same time, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to reach out about, you know, because we love the Gulf. You know, <laughs> a lot of the time people are introduced to us in, in a tragic way, but uh, maybe we're biased, but we think it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Uh, if you care about wetlands, the Mississippi River Delta is the only river-dominated delta on the planet, you know. And so it's very unique in its shape, the dynamics, and then just the way it produces food. So <laughs> we hope people can go through this uh, project, see some of the things that have happened, but also dream with us about the, the hope for restoring it uh, uh, um, after all, you know, all of the oil drilling has gone away. Thank you so much, Scott. Very cool. Okay, Caroline, ready to segue back to HQ? Sure. How do we get there? Uh, how about canoe? Sounds like a plan. All right, want to take the front? Yeah, just hold steady. I'm going to get my paddle and let's go. All right. Whoa, there. Okay. Well, that wraps it up for us here at Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together. Join us again next month right here in Bob's Sound Library and Tropical Fish Emporium for another action-packed sit-sci adventure. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you'll find thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools that you can get started with to turn your curiosity about the world into real impact. It's at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R, -E like you're starting the science, dot org. SciStarter is supported by a number of generous partners and collaborators from all around the world. SciStarter's founder is Darlene Cavalier, and thank you so much to you, the listener and the citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas you want to share with us and things you want to hear on this podcast, get in touch with us at info at SciStarter.org. Our email address is info at SciStarter.org. Thanks again, Bob, and I'll see you next month.